So once again, hi everyone and welcome to the third and final event in the Archives Roadshow 2022 series. This series has been in the works since before I started working at the JPL over the summer. So it's been a long time coming and it's been really wonderful to experience such awesome presentations uh, and to be present for such enriching discussions following the presentations. Before we officially got started today, we conducted a really quick Zoom poll, which for those of you in attendance live, you will see the results when I share them now. Here we go. And for those of you watching this recording later, you won't see them, but I can recap that. So most of our uh, audience is joining us from Canada. It looks about equal between Eastern, Western, and, Nor and sorry, North America, excluding Canada. Um, and the majority of people joining us today have a general interest in Jewish history. So I'll just stop sharing that. Um, so thank you to the more than 60 people who are with us live today. I would also like to thank the Azraeli Foundation who made this event series possible. My name is Ellen Belshaw. I am the outreach, uh, sorry, the education outreach librarian. I should know that one by now. At the Jewish Public Library and Archive in Montreal. Myself and my colleague, Izel Carter, the digital outreach librarian, will be facilitating this session for you today. After my brief introduction, I will be turning over the floor to the first of three presenters. At the end of the three 15 minute presentations, we will stop the recording and dive into a question and discussion period with the three presenters you see here. Um, and then we will invite the director of library services and special collections of the JPL, Eddie Paul, to speak a bit to the impact of the series more broadly. Those of you who've been here before are likely familiar with the structure by now, but I'll explain brief briefly for those of you who are joining us for the first time. This is a Zoom webinar, which unlike a meeting, has audience members muted with their cameras off upon entry. If you have any questions for the presenters in either English or French, we have a Q&A feature that you can find at the bottom of your Zoom window. And if you have any technical questions, you can either leave them there. They won't be public until we, we say they're public. So don't worry if you have a technical question, we won't, uh, we won't show that to everyone. Or you can email events at jplmontreal.org. Um, and while you can add your questions at any time, we will hold them until the end for the discussion period. Before we dive into the presentations, I would like to share the Jewish Public Library's land acknowledgement. The Jewish Public Library is situated on the traditional territory of the Ganyangahaga people. The land is also a meeting place for many Indigenous nations. This land has been the site of exchange, creativity, and storytelling for thousands of years. We are grateful to be able to cultivate lifelong learning, imagination, dialogue, and creativity here. The order of presentations will be carried out in the same order that they were listed in promotional material for this event. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Elisa Rutenberg. Elisa has been the archivist at the Jewish Museum and Archives of BC for seven years, where she began shortly after graduating from McGill University with a master's in library and information studies. At the JMABC, Elisa is responsible for the, uh, managing all archives projects from initial acquisition through processing and even digitization. In addition to this work, Elisa has uh, also works with the team to publish the annual journal, The Scribe, which focuses on different research topics within the Jewish community each year. As the Jewish community of BC grows and changes, the JMABC is especially interested in seeking out stories of intersectionality and dynamic storytelling, whether that be through a podcast, online exhibit, or our very popular Supper Club in 2017. Alyssa works, works extensively with students and volunteers through a number of grants and work programs to get all of this important work done and relishes the chance to engage new people with our shared community history. Welcome, Alyssa. Thank you, Ellen. Um, on to my first slide, please. So the Jewish Museum and Archives uh, started in 1971 officially, which means that we celebrated our 50th anniversary last year. And we started as, uh, as many of my co-presenters, I'm sure, did with a small historical society that was really created to help uh, support the work of a couple of researchers. And from there, we grew into a archives um, that has permanent full-time staff, an off-site storage space, and we have a large board of at least 12 people. We have a number of committees. We have many, many projects these days. Uh, one of our more recent projects was looking back, moving forwards um, to celebrate our 50th anniversary. We did 160 years of Jewish history in BC. 
and that documents all the community building um, that so many of our own members and community members undertook um, and celebrated stories that we had kind of long since forgotten um, or hadn't been celebrated enough in the past. Uh, next slide. So the Jewish Museum and Archives of BC today um, takes up almost 3,000 square feet out in Richmond, BC, um, close to our office in Vancouver. We have approximately 325 linear meters of archival material, um, tons of material in the backlog as well that needs to be processed that we're slowly but surely working on. We also have a really massive photo collection for an archive of our sives um, with about 340,000 photographs, uh, negatives, prints um, are all included in there. And I'm gonna talk today about one of those, uh, well, just one photo from one of the collections um, that, that tally up those 340,000 photos. We also have really recently passed a thousand oral histories recorded. So our oral history program started actually before the archives did. We started in 1968, um, just recording oral histories with people who had helped build the community. So those stories are really amazing because we are interviewing people in the late 60s who are in their 80s and 90s um, who had helped build the city of Vancouver. Um, unlike Toronto and Ottawa, we have a much more recent history here. So that really does... Uh, include people who who were some of the first to come here, um, usually coming across from the prairies, but also you have people coming up from California for the gold rush um, and starting starting the community. So next slide. My artifact today um, is a very famous photograph, The Lions, done by Leonard Frank in approximately 1919. So this photograph is of these two mountain peaks that are in the North Shore Mountains. Um, they, uh, they hover over all of Vancouver. Uh, you can see them from most places in Vancouver if you have a clear view. Um, they are also the um, naming inspiration for many Vancouver companies as well as landmarks. We have the Lionsgate Bridge. Uh, Lionsgate Entertainment is also named for them. They're um, a pretty famous movie studio. And all of this comes from just the one photo that Leonard Frank took. Um, so Leonard Frank was a German born photographer who came to, uh, came to North America and then came up to Victoria um, in approximately 1890. He then lived in Al uh, Port Alberni for a little while. And then he came to Vancouver around the turn of the century. He was an outdoorsman. He loved to climb and hike and take his uh, photography rig with him everywhere. Um, I think on to the next slide. Um, so Leonard Frank took photos of the entire province, basically anywhere that he could reach, uh, even places that seem kind of unreachable today, he went to. He traveled around, he took tons of photos of mountains, uh, lakes, various landscapes all around the province, um, really started on Vancouver Island and then moved to the mainland. And everywhere he went, his camera went. Um, so he uh, took these photos of the province as it grew and changed. Um, the difference from 1900 to 2022 today is really stunning. Um, the amount of industry, the amount of changes that have happened in this province are really striking. Um, so uh, on to the next slide. Um, these are just, as, as I continue through my presentation, you'll just see some of the other photos he took. Um, now the lions are significant because they do loom over Vancouver. Um, they're actually also known as the twin sisters. Um, these mountains are, um, are quite close to Vancouver. They were first ascended by a expedition led by uh, Squamish chief um, Joe Capilano in the late 1800s and uh, since then there have been many ascents the first official recorded one was in 1903 um, and they are just kind of part of the landscape uh, anyone from Vancouver knows that when you're looking north you look for the mountains um, that's that's part of our um, our city uh, city history 
So next slide. So Leonard Frank uh, took tons of photos, as I said. Um, some of his most striking are the logging photos, which I always have a bit of a hard personal time with. Um, he photographed the province as it was changing, as these amazing old growth cedars were being logged and being turned into houses. So these are just a couple of the photos that really show the scale of what these trees had been um, and how much they changed the province. And <laughs> they're really hard to look at, but I'm really glad that someone was there photographing this, documenting all of this. Um, unfortunately, these activities happened in the province. There's, there's no way around that. That was choices that were made many generations ago. And at least we have the photographs. Um, we know what the province used to look like. Uh, and in later years, um, Leonard Frank would end up uh, photographing more and more of Vancouver. And then I'll talk about the man who actually took over his business after him, um, because together they, the Leonard Frank photo studio was comprised of really two photographers who spanned 90 years of BC history. On to the next. Um, so in, as I said, in later years, uh, Leonard Frank also photographed um, the city. He, he really liked royal visits. He really liked um, any kind of visiting dignitaries. Uh, this is a photo of World War I troops marching down Granville Street um, in 1914. Um, he also photographed Komogata Maru. Um, unfortunately, there's only a couple of those photos. He also, we believe, although we don't have the photos, photographed the internment camps um, later on at the um, Pacific National Exhibition Grounds um, where Japanese citizens were interned um, during the war. And uh, in 1940, um, Leonard Frank slowly retired from the business and it was sold to another German Jewish man, Otto Landauer. Um, Otto continued his tradition, but province was really changing around this time. Otto, while a noted outdoorsman as well, we have tons of photos of him up in the mountains. Um, he really photographed the building of the lower mainland specifically. So this is the, uh, the Port Man Bridge above the Fraser River. Um, this is an amazing series of photos. He also took photos of the Iron Workers Memorial Bridge. Um, he photographed most of the building of UBC um, where you, you can see these buildings that are still here today that are now undergoing seismic upgrades and, um, and all sorts of modernization. Um, and we use those photos all the time in our collection. So you really go from out in the backwoods to the downtown core, um, to UBC, to these buildings that are still very present today. Um, and Otto Landauer continued the business. So he started in uh, 1940, and he ended up working basically until his death in 1980. Um, both of these men were German Jewish um, immigrants who we don't really know the connection between the two. Um, we, I, I could go into a whole history there, but um, for whatever reason, one picked up the other's business and, and they continued onwards. Um, on to the next slide. Um, again, just these, these stunning photos of the province. Um, so the, the photos over the years, um, Leonard Frank himself produced about 25,000 photographs in his lifetime. Uh, his collection is a little more scattered. There's a number at the Vancouver Public Library, the Alberni Valley Museum, um, the Royal BC Museum. They were kind of collected by institutions in those locations that he was photographing. And then in later years, we were op offered the opportunity to buy the collection, um, which includes a lot of the logging photos, as well as a majority of Otto Landauer's uh, lower mainland photos. Um, this came about because our founder was friends with Otto's widow. Um, so it's, it's funny how these connections get made. She herself, I believe, was not Jewish, um, but ended up really participating in Jewish community life. Um, and became a close personal friend of the organization. And that's part of why we own them today. Uh, she decided that this is where she wanted her husband's legacy to remain. 
Um, so while most of the content of the photos isn't Jewish, it was important to her that this is where the uh, the collection of her husband work um, would stay forever. Next, yeah. Oh, sorry, getting ahead of myself. Um, Anyway, uh, so we hold the largest collection of them. We also, uh, I'm proud to say, have a track record of being some of the most available um, or, or being the institution who makes the most available. We work really hard to make sure that these photos are accessible, are usable in presentations, in publicity. Um, and, and this photo exists everywhere. There's so many copies of it that that are out here now. Um, on an earlier slide, I pulled those, there were three photos um, that showed different versions. Uh, I believe one was a postcard from eBay, one was an Etsy print, and one was one of ours. Um, so this photo has been repro reproduced everywhere. And I just think it's really interesting um, how it relates to our mandate of collecting, preserving, and sharing the history of Jewish people in BC, because both of these photographers, especially Leonard Frank, were Jewish, um, part, did participate in the community. Leonard Frank is buried in the Jewish cemetery out in New Westminster, but their content is not necessarily Jewish. And it's had a really interesting effect on our collection policies even today. We have a number of photography collections that um, were done by Jewish photographers who, um, who can talk about how it related to their lives. But if you look at them, these photos themselves uh, aren't necessarily of synagogues. They aren't of the Jewish community centers. They aren't even of uh, Jewish community members. So that's created a really interesting history for us that I think makes us a little unique um, from some Jewish archives in Canada. Um, so just to name a couple, because I think I'm good on time, uh, we have um, Fred Schiffer, who was a portrait photographer who worked uh, in downtown Vancouver from the 1960s through 1980s. He took uh, thousands, I believe about 8,000 portraits over those years, um, everything from passport photos to beautiful wedding photos offsite. We have um, Irving Snyder, who was a dentist who went on extensive travels um, and donated all of his uh, materials after. Um, when he, when he felt he was ready to retire from that part of his life. Uh, we have Ronnie Tesler's photos and she uh, worked throughout the province and most notably uh, took photos of rodeos up in the interior of the province, um, which you can see in an online exhibit on our website. Um, and those are just a few of the different photography collections that we're able to have that um, just really add, add variety to our, our uh, collection and, and aren't just, um, the standard community photos, the, the the groundbreaking of the JCC, that sort of thing, um, which we do also have a lot of thanks to the Jewish Western Bulletin archives. Um, and in this moment, I realize I forgot my land acknowledgement at the beginning, so I will just add that in before I wrap up. Um, the Jewish Museum and Archives of BC is located in Vancouver on the tra traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. And I today am coming you to you from the um, actual land of the Musqueam people. And uh, yeah, I think that's everything I have to say. Great, thank you, Alyssa. Um, next up, we have Katie Baker, who joined the JHSSA in 2011 as their part-time office administrator. She has since added coordinator of programming and editor of JHSSA's journal Discovery to her list of hats, which may be broadly summarized as covering everything in the JHSSA office that isn't the job of the archivist. She enjoys working collaboratively with JHSSA archivist Roberta Kerr, including on preparations for this presentation. Katie has a master's degree in music from Indiana University and is also active as a musician and music educator in Calgary. Welcome, Katie. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Katie Baker, and I'm joining you from Calgary, Alberta, which falls within Treaty 7 and is in the traditional territory of the Kainai, Pekani, Siksika, Stony Nakoda, and Sutina Nations, and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. I recognize that the Jewish history we preserve exists with, within the larger, difficult context of settler colonialism, and I seek to find ways to respectfully acknowledge and honor these tangled histories and their impact on the present. 
JHSSA, which is not the most pronounceable acronym, um, is delighted to be part of the Archives Roadshow for several reasons. First of all, because the idea, 11 objects and 11 stories, how much fun is that? And also because, like many of our colleagues, we mostly work alone and we'll jump at pretty much any opportunity to talk about our stuff. But we're also glad to be here because we're a very small repository with a history that's largely not familiar to people from outside the prairies. And a program like this one gives us the chance to talk about some things that you might not know or might not have a time frame or context for. And the more we thought about it, and the more we resigned ourselves to the fact that we didn't get to do all 11 stories and objects just ourselves, the more we realized that there is, in fact, one particular item in our holdings that, in a way, tells all the stories you need to know about us. It's called the AZA Chinook, and at first glance, it's simply a yearbook published in May 1942 by Calgary AZA. Next slide. First of all, a bit of background. 1942 was the 15th anniversary of AZA in Calgary. What some of you may not know is that it was also the 15th anniversary of AZA in Canada. The full name of the Calgary chapter, which was instituted in 1926, was First International 31. The number designating that it was the 31st AZA chapter since the organization's founding and the words confirming that it was the first chapter to ever be established outside of the United States. We know that the Calgary chapter was quite active right from the beginning. And from 1936, we have several copies of an AZA newsletter called The Clarion. Slide, please. We don't know when they changed the name, but we do have a reference to the Chinook newsletter being revived after a lapse of several years. The 1942 edition is, so far as we've found, the only one that used the yearbook format. And it's the format that makes it so valuable to us as a resource. Other AZA publications were very much newsletter in design, mimeographed sheets of paper stapled together at the corner and aimed primarily at their own internal readership. But the AZA 1942 Chinook is an actual soft cover book 63 pages long. We're very fortunate to have been given several copies of this book in various states of repair. So this is the duplicate, if coverless copy, that we keep in our subject files. And while most of the volumes consists of photos and descriptions of AZA events and activities, it's remarkable how many windows it provided into what else was going on in the Calgary Jewish community at the time. A perfect example is close to the front, where there's a list, because it's 1942, after all, of people from Calgary and Southern Alberta who were serving with the military. Uh, next slide, please. What's great about it is that it isn't limited to folks who are connected to AZA. Now, as some of you may know, JHSSA has spent a lot of time over the past decade establishing and maintaining a database of Southern Alberta veterans of the World Wars. Jewish veterans, to be specific. And some of the World War II veterans don't show up on any other lists beside this one. So without it, we wouldn't have even known to look for them. We also want to share the page facing the Roll of Honor. And there's no local connection. Next slide, please. But the essay is by the American Broadway and film star, Eddie Cantor, born Izzy Itzkowitz. Itzkowitz. And back in the day, having him in the book would have been a pretty big deal. So after that, we get to the meat of the book with the Calgary AZA section. It starts with photos and messages from the local executive and advisors, and then has 10 pages of photos and bios of chapter members, both past and current. Next slide, please. A lot of the blurbs are pretty much what you'd expect from fellows in their mid to late teens, but many of them include references to the other activities or organizations, some of which were new to us, and sometimes to various family connections and relationships. And some of the bios, especially those of the older fellows, mention military service or training. We're particularly grateful for the handwritten annotations in this section of our archival copy that indicate the branch of service for many AZA members who had enlisted at some point after the book's publication. So after the bios, the section moves to sports and gives us some interesting new to us community information. 
We'd already known, for example, that for several years, there'd been a skating rink on a piece of undeveloped land beside our community building, the House of Israel. But the yearbook adds to that, telling us that for many of those years, it was AZA who had been sponsoring the rink. It also mentions that organized hockey within the Jewish community first got going in 1930, with AZA participation in a city of Calgary initiative called the Unity League, which apparently also hosted basketball games. Now, we haven't had a chance yet to do any further research into that league, but thanks to the AZA Chinook, we know it existed and that our community was part of it. Broader community involvement also comes up in the next section, which is the literary one. It's a collection of essays and articles, and one of the most interesting entries is an article that describes a recent youth and dem democracy rally. These citywide rallies were apparently an annual AZA event, and the one in 1942, and I quote, surpassed anything that had previously been accomplished in this city along these lines. Co-sponsors for the rally included the Young People's Society of the United Church, the Anglican Young People's Society, the Chinese Young People's Society, and the Canadian Girls in Training, who were, and in fact still are, a non-denominational Christian girls group. And that brings us to the social section, which is only a few pages long, but it's a great resource for connecting various people and organizations within the community. Slide, please. It is full of bits of information that we haven't found anywhere else. For example, one of its entries provides a starting date for one of Calgary's earliest Jewish sororities. And other entries tell us about three more sororities that were, again, new to us. Um, I, don't, I don't need to change the slide again, sorry. Um, there are items for junior chapters of both Hadassah and National Council, and the section gives a rousing shout out for the work of the Calgary Young Judeans, noting that it's the second largest Judean club in the Dominion. One of the most interesting social entries talks about the establishment and activities of the community's swing club, which began as an AZA initiative in 1940. I just want to check which slide we are on. Um, sorry, in 1940. If we're not looking at the sling, swing club yet, please change the slide. If we are, please don't. Yes, perfect, thank you. The swing clubs of the day were devoted to swing style music and dancing, and apparently several AZA members reached out to the various Jewish youth groups in the city who came together and formed what became a standalone community entity. They decided to hold dances every second Sunday at the community center with music provided by a jukebox, sometimes a live band. In an interesting side note, these dances were held in the basement of the community building. Not because that's where the designated youth area was or anything, but because that's all the usable space there was in the building at the time. Construction had started in 1930, but after they finished the lower level and upper shell, the funds ran out. Which makes it all the more touching that in their first year of operation, the swing club raised and donated $100 to the community center, which was finally completed in 1949. We don't know if the swing club was still running then. The Chinook tells us that they had 160 members in 1942. And so far, that's all we know. Speaking of numbers and dates, we now come to what is perhaps one of the most significant sections of the yearbook. Interestingly, I mean the advertisements, including 53 business ads, often naming the proprietor or other staff. Some of the community's social and service clubs took out ads too, as well as over 100 families and individuals in the personal greetings section. Now those numbers may not sound like much, especially to those of you from larger communities, but here's some perspective for you. If you take the number of households in the greetings section and add in the ones represented in the business ads, and we've checked, there's not much overlap, you end with some 30% of the overall Jewish population in Calgary at the time. Putting down the funds, to take out an ad in a youth group yearbook. Think about that, 30%. Most organizations are happy to get that level of support from their own members, never mind the community at large. Now, it's been said that one of the characteristics of a smaller community is the fact that it tends to be a little tighter, a bit more cohesive than a larger one. Because when there are fewer of you, you need each other more. You're that much more affected by each other's successes and failures. In his closing remark, 
the Chinook editor, Alp Kipnis, talks about the graphic used for the cover of the yearbook's sections, a V for victory. Slide, please. And towards that, he says that the purpose of the 15th anniversary publication is to encourage a somewhat new enthusiasm. Let's go. Yeah, thank you. Um, maybe what it comes down to is that in a community the size of wartime Calgary's, enthusiasms, new or old, tend to spill over. We're that much more aware of each other. Regardless of the endeavor, different activities, different interests are sometimes going to overlap and are certainly more likely to intersect. And that's what we see through the pages of the Chinook. It's the intersections of a small, quite committed community. And that's what makes it a volume that provides so much more than just a reflection on the organization that published it. It's one volume, one object, but we think you'll agree it opens up the door to way more than 11 stories. We thank several individuals who have donated copies of this wonderful volume to our archives, and we especially thank the Jewish Public Library of Montreal and all of you for the opportunity to share it. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. I'll just leave that slide up just for a moment, just so everyone can see the contact info in case you need it. And while that's up, I will introduce our next speaker. We have Andrew Morrison with us, um, who has been working with the Jewish Heritage Center of Western Canada since 2017. Andrew graduated from the University of Toronto with a master's in information and has previously worked with the Manitoba Teacher Society, the Archdiocese of Rupert's Land, and the Archives of Toronto. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you. Um, I begin with our land acknowledgments. I would like to acknowledge that we are on the, the Jewish Heritage Center of Western Canada on the ancestral lands and on Treaty 1 territory, and that these lands are the heartland of the Métis people. And I'd like to acknowledge that our water is sourced from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation in Treaty 3 territory, and our collection covers uh, lands of Indigenous people from other treaties, as, as well as unceded Indigenous land. Um, and I'll just give an introduction on the next slide to the Jewish Heritage Center of Western Canada. Um, I think we're all burdened by awkward acronyms. So the JH, the Jewish Historical Society of Western Canada was uh, formed in 1968. Um, like many historical societies, it came out of um, Canadian centennial celebrations in 1967. Um, the early years, the concentration, the, the main effort was um, towards producing a book and a museum exhibit called Journey into Our Heritage. Um, this exhibit was in what at the time was the uh, Museum of Man and Nature here in Winnipeg. It's now the uh, Manitoba Museum. And the um, exhibit also traveled extensively across Canada throughout the 1970s. Um, it's also at this time that they began publishing the series Jewish Life and Times. Uh, so far, eight volumes have been published, with another one expected in 2023. Um, very early on, um, we also began an extensive oral history program. Um, this included both um, just individuals, as well as um, projects looking into specific areas of Jewish life in Western Canada. Um, in my opinion, is really one of one of the gems of our holdings. Um, in 1997, the the Historical Society moved into the new uh, Jewish campus in the south end of Winnipeg. And in 1998, it merged with the Ed and Marion Vicker Museum of Western Canada, the Freeman Foundation Holocaust Education Center, um, and it changed its name to the Jewish Historical Center of Western Canada. Um, we have uh, museum exhibits here in the Asper Jewish Community Campus, as well as a permanent Holocaust Education Center that um, gives presentations to uh, schools in Manitoba, as well as many other organizations. Um, our collection really expands from Northwest Ontario um, across to BC, um, but our main um, collection mostly relates to Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Um, and it dates back to the, the earliest um, Jewish communities in Winnipeg were in the 1880s and 1890s, um, which is where our, our collection really begins to. Next slide, please. So my presentation will be on the 
the individual that that I get asked about the most working here, um, Louis Sloten. Um, some of you may be familiar with him. Uh, Sloten was born in 1910 here in Winnipeg. His parents um, uh, fled pro pogroms in Russia. He completed his bachelor's of science and his master's of science here at the University of Manitoba. And he went on to uh, do his PhD at King's College London. Um, afterwards, he worked as a research assistant in at the University of, of uh, Chicago. Um, next slide, please. In 1942, he began working on the Manhattan Project, project which built the first nuclear weapons during World War II. Um, his first experience with uh, nuclear power was in the University of Chicago. He helped um, build their uh, small nuclear reactor in their physics department. This is a photo of, of him in his office in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Um, Sloten was involved with what were known as criticality tests and were known amongst other, as this experiment was known as tickling the dragon's tail. Um, if you click, go on the next slide, please. So there's a YouTube video embedded in here. If you can control, click on it. If it doesn't work, I can just explain it. If you control and click on the image, it should take you to YouTube. I'd have to swap screens, but what we can do actually, because I did get a chance to watch it, is I would love to include it with our feedback um, for everybody when we send out the sure. forms for all participants. Sure. Um, so the link was, so if you've ever seen the movie, um, I believe it came out in 1989, called uh, um, Fat Man and Little Boy, which is about the Manhattan Project. Um, John Cusack's character is a, a fictional character, but it's loosely based on Louis Sloten. And the clip um, shows the experiment that he was working on. And the reason that many people, so many people ask about him um, is that an accident occurred during one of these experiments and Sloten was exposed to a, a fatal dose of radiation and died uh, nine days later. So the experiment involved uh, a sample of plutonium, approximately that big, and there were two spheres of a metal called beryllium that he would slowly lower over the uh, plutonium and they would measure the amount of radiation that was coming out. In this one instance, he slipped and the two halves closed, which caused a, um, uh, a fusion reaction and plutonium sample went critical. He was, Apparently, the a blue light was emitted, and everyone in the room felt a slight tingle. So the movie actually does a fairly ac the the depiction of this accident in the movie is fairly accurate. Um, there were several other people in the room, but Sloten was the only person. He was obviously the closest person. He was the only person who was fatally um, radiated. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, so his parents were flown, were notified immediately, and the, the American army actually flew his parents down to Los Alamos immediately. Um, they arrived four days after the accident and remained by his bedside. Um, as I said, he passed away nine days after the experiment. Um, after the experiment, within seconds, he vomited, and then slowly, basically every function in his body from the... Um, organ level all the way down to the cellular level began to shut down. Um, so this is a certificate that was awarded to him. If you go to the next slide. So this is the specific item I wanted to talk about. This was, these were, this is the actual size of the item. These were silver pins that were given out to um, everyone who had any, any involvement with the Manhattan Project. Um, silver pins were given to anyone who worked on the project for at least a year, and bronze pins were given out to people who worked less than a year. Um, in the end, 
more than 170,000 of these were given out, which gives you some idea of the size of the Manhattan Project. Um, next slide. So the, the phone that these records are in is really the Sloten family phone. These records come to us from his parents. Um, most of the records in the fall are actually letters of condolence that were sent to his parents after his death. Um, there's also a small amount of peer material that was Sloan's himself, um, mostly correspondence um, that he was receiving shortly before the accident happened. And as you can see, there were even a few, he had already received a few letters in between the time of the accident when he's got out of the accident and his death. Um, while he was working on the Manhattan Project was actually wrapping up at this time, and he had already made plans to um, resume teaching at the University of Chicago, and there are letters from the University of Chicago indicating that in the, in the collection. Um, the next slide. So here's an example, just a tiny example of um, the telegraphs that were received by his parents. Um, I think just interesting. Huh? form of technology that we don't really use anymore. There were hundreds and hundreds of telegrams sent from all over the world to his parents. Um, these include both people who knew uh, Sloan and his parents personally, as well as um, people from all over the physics world and the Jewish community around the world um, who had simply heard about the accident. The next slide. Um, so his body was flown back here to Winnipeg, and he's buried here in the Sherzedek Cemetery. Um, there were over 2,000 people attended the, um, the funeral. And it was, it was major news around the world. As you can see here, it was a big deal in Winnipeg. Um, next slide. So as I said, most of the, the collection actually is condolence letters from um, sent to his parents. And these are just a few examples to show you the, the sort of breadth of um, people who sent condolence letters. This is um, from the Hoffer family. Um, the uh, Jewish community of Hoffer, Saskatchewan was named after the, uh, the family. Um, next slide. And here's another example of um, some people who knew the Slotons personally and uh, sent a letter, a handwritten letter, including. Um, let's give people a chance to just glance over that. Uh, the next slide. And as you can see, it wasn't just um, individuals who were sending him letters as well. It was. Um, Jewish organizations um, from all over the world, but especially Jewish organizations in Canada. Um, it, was, it was a big deal throughout the Jewish community and the scientific community at the time. Um, next slide. Um, so yeah, so this is one of the uh, most sought after collections in our holdings. Um, recently, um, we were contacted by um, a group in Los Alamos, Texas, who is building on the, the Manhattan Project territory. They're building a, a museum dedicated to the project, which will apparently include a building known as the Sloten Building, um, as well as there's uh, currently a French PhD student who um, is currently writing a book on Sloten. And, um, Many other members of the public um, have shown much interest in this over the years. Um, I think that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. I think we're having some uh, computer feedback, if you don't mind just unmuting for me. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Um, so thank you to all the presenters. Uh, before we end the recording and dive into the question period, I just want to say thank you, uh, in addition to the presenters, to all the people who are attending live today. 
Um, it's been really wonderful having you with us. Um, we'll be sending out a follow-up email through Eventbrite that has a link to today's session. Um, oh, sorry, the recording that will come out of today's session that will be on YouTube, along with the recordings from the last two sessions, as well as any pertinent links like the video that uh, Andrew was just mentioning and the contact info provided by each uh, presenter and a feedback form to this event so you can let us know um, what you thought of the event. We love getting community feedback and by filling it out, it helps us continue to improve our offerings. So happy holidays, everyone, and stay tuned for new programming that we'll be launching in the new year.